morning. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you that Jesus gave up his throne in heaven to come down and be born the very creature that he created, to restore us back to a right relationship with you, that the word became flesh and dwelled among us and died for us to redeem us back, to ransom us from a life, an existence, an eternity where we would never know you, O oh God. We thank you that through your spirit we can call you Father, Daddy. And Lord, we just come today to hear your words, to apply them to our lives. We thank you and praise you for the grace that we have through Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord, and our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to remind you today about our allegiance to King Jesus. King Jesus, we kind of forget that sometimes. We talk about Jesus and everything, but we forget that He is a sovereign King. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords, and we are to serve Him. Let alone we're a creation. God created us, so we've got a purpose that, that God created us for, and that's to worship Him, to honor Him, to give Him glory. Our lives belong to Him, the very breath that we have is breath that he gave us for his purpose, his glory. And then King Jesus gave up his throne to come down and die to redeem us back because of sin. I was talking to Troy the other day. Oh, and by the way, I probably won't be quite as long as he was. <laughs> but I'll still be long because there's a lot to cover. Um, if you haven't been with us, uh, we are reading through, and yeah, let this pierce the ones that aren't. We're reading through as the body of Christ, the family, brothers and sisters, we're reading through the Bible together. And to keep you on track, I'm preaching over what we talked about. And if you look in your bulletins, you'll see a little handout for Jonah and Amos because you will read them this week. Uh, if I played the videos today, I'd be really long. So it's your, uh, up to you to play the videos. We play videos from the Truth Project and the little drawing is a drawing that outlines what they've said. Very good curriculum, good for about any age. So you've got the sheets on that. You'll also touch into Isaiah this week. But this past week, we primarily went through Kings and Chronicles, right? And we see all these kings all over the place, and you've got to be careful reading because you'll jump from Israel, which is not Israel. It is Israel by name, but not by people because it's the northern kingdom who have built a, made a copy of worship, yeah. which follows even to Jesus' day when he's talking to the woman at the well in Samaria and says, you worship differently. You worship what is not true. Because, see, they had split off from Judah, and Judah's got the temple, and Judah's got the Levites. They had to do something if they didn't want their people going to the enemy, believe it or not. And the whole reason we're in a divided kingdom is because David failed to teach his son what he should have taught him. And then his son followed after him. And if you remember from your reading, the people asked him to, to, re to relieve the slave labor and the taxes, and he said, no way. I want more. I'm going to be even harder than my dad was. So we've got a divided kingdom. We've got false worship going on in, in the northern kingdom called Israel, and we've got so-so worship. The reason I say so-so worship, how should we love the Lord? with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, strength, and they were worshiping with half their heart. 
which is no condemnation there. We're always guilty of that. But like David, a man after God's own heart, when we see that, it's time to repent and to turn back to God because he's always there with open arms. If he loved you enough to send his son to die for you, then what in the world would ever keep you from him except yourself? The reason I talk about King Jesus is when I was talking to Troy, he understood that concept because, see, he lives in a country where there is a king. We don't live in that concept, so we, we take it for granted. But he said, you don't get near the king of Thailand, period. You don't, you don't make an appointment to see him or anything. You can't go see him unless he desires to see you. See, God desires to not only see you but to know you as his child. And whatever the king says, he has total authority. His men jump and do it. That's what a king is. He sits on his throne and his servants obey him and give allegiance to him. That's what I named this title. Allegiance to King Jesus. So as we're start, studying the story of kings, there's so many great stories there. As I read one, I'm like, I'm preaching on that. Then I read another, I'm preaching on that. I don't know what I'm preaching on until God tells me, and you'll, you'll find out where we're at here in a little bit. You'll see good and bad kings. You'll see people that, that followed, Jesus, followed King Jesus, yes, even though he wasn't alive yet and they didn't know his name, the promised. You'll see God's faithfulness, but yet you'll see his judgment also. There's so much information there. I hope that you are reading along. We'll read, we st our reading started out with King Jehoshaphat. And he was a pretty good king. And here's a scripture I want to share with you. 2 Chronicles 20, 32 and 33. He followed the ways of his father Asa. Guys, women too, your children are watching your behavior. Yeah. Your words don't mean so much. They hear them. But if your behavior is not consistent with your words, they watch and learn from your behavior. You know that if you've got children. You know it already. You can tell them, don't do this, don't do that, and they'll call you short on it because they have that childlike faith. That faith that says, if a farmer came and went and sowed seed, why would he care about the rocky soil? Well, he does care for them. That's why he sowed the seed so extravagantly. Why would he care about the thorny soil? Why would he care about the rocky soil? He wants to produce a crop in you. That's what matters to the farmer. But he loves you so much that he scatters the seed everywhere so that he can get a crop. But a child realizes the only crop that mattered was the fertile ground, and that's what we need to be. We need to be a fertile, have a fertile life for King Jesus. So 2 Chronicles 20, 32 and 33 says, He followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, that's a but for you that don't understand that. The contrast here, were not removed. They didn't take all of the pagan things out of their life. They held on. Jesus is clear about that. He says, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back longingly, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom. There is a dictator, a king, a king of all kings, a lord of all lords. And like I said, we don't understand that concept so much in this world today. Since they didn't remove those, the people still had not set their hearts on the God of their ancestors. God demands our worship. We were created to worship Him. He has bought us back with the blood of King Jesus to worship Him. Our lives belong to Him. God will not tolerate sin and disobedience. He will punish it. If you can't see that through these different kings, then you need to go back and read it again. God punishes sin. He has to. Or heaven would not be a place that we want it to be, and God would not be a God that we want Him to be. He has to punish sin. But see, Jesus Christ also laid a way that we could be restored back to Him because He didn't sin. So His sacrifice was accepted to God. It was complete. Where He could say on the cross that it was finished and all we need to do is carry faith in Him to carry His robes of righteousness. In the very next chapter in 2 Chronicles 21, we read about a second king. 
King Jehoram. I'm glad Troy stumbled with them too. It makes you feel better, don't you? Because you feel like you're the only one that stumbled over these names. 2 Chronicles 21, 12 through 14. King Jehoram, I'll get it out in a minute, received a letter from Elijah the prophet which, which said, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. You have not followed the ways of your father Jehoshaphat or Asa king of Judah, but you have followed the ways of the kings of Israel. And you have led Judah and the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves, both kingdoms not satisfactory in their worship. Judah still has the Lord God, not something false, but yet they're prostituting themselves. They have found another lover, another love, not the one that their soul should long for. Just as the house of Ahab did, this despicable king, that's what you're comparing him to. You have also murdered your own brothers, members of your own family, men who were better than you. So the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and everything that is yours with a heavy blow. Now look at those consequences. What's there? You, but your sons, your wives, your family, which is a heritage and a blessing from the Lord. The institutions that God set up before sin ever came into this world, they're affected by the sins of the fathers. You read that, but you don't think about it when you're out doing these things. Think about it. Every sin that you do has a consequence. And Jesus told us to be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. He's equipped you with the Spirit of God to lead you in the right path. But sometimes we have to stop and think, don't we, and ask God for direction so we stay on that straight and narrow path. Because the Lord will punish and it will affect your family and even your friends, your servants, anything that you're associated with. Sin will infect it. Your children will follow the actions that you do more than they ever follow your words. We read a little book about Obadiah too. Remember that one? Short, you might have missed it. Shortest book of the Old Testament, 21 verses. And this is Obadiah's prophecy. From verse 15, The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Uh-oh. But it sounds familiar, doesn't it? And I, hadn't I heard another verse that sounds kind of like that? I believe Jesus said it. Matthew 7, verses 12 through 14. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. <laughs> For this sums up the law and the prophets. Wow. Imagine that. Then verse 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let's see. As I read this word and nourish on it, it becomes alive and living in me. The Spirit telling me about Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, because He reveals the Father. Then I can understand what I'm reading, apply it to my lives, and have the power living inside of me to do it. That I am actually the temple where people come to see what God is like. Right. Wow. But you've got to read it first. Okay? Okay. So back to our reading from this past week. We read about Elisha being called the man of God and Elisha being called the man of God. Think about that. How do they compare to the Son of God? If you didn't listen to the man of God back then, <laughs> you were in trouble. What do you think if you don't listen to King Jesus, the one and only Son of God who gave his life for you? You think God's going to be happy with your so-called sacrifices? Give your heart wholeheartedly to King Jesus. Give him your allegiance. So Elisha is a true prophet. We see him as different from the other prophets. And there are so many prophets in the northern kingdom. But what I, Elijah, Elijah and Elisha said comes true, doesn't it? You think what Jesus said is going to come, through, come true? You think he is going to return and he is going to judge and separate the sheep from the goats? And don't forget also that it says, Jesus says, I have my reward with me. Next week, hopefully, you guys who have been faithful 
Now that gives you guys who haven't been faithful a chance to catch up. You're going to get a little reward. Jacob and Michaela made these. And they want to make them for each one who has been diligent. And let me give you a concept that gets missed from the church so much today. Reward. Jesus teaches it. The Bible teaches it. He rewards those children who are faithful. Now let me give you an example. You got three sons, right, David? And one of them is going to get a special award because of his good behavior and everything. Don't you all go and celebrate? I mean, that's just natural. I don't know how it's all going to be on that day, but I know that Jesus says that he will reward those. The disciples have their names engraved on the pillars. Don't miss a life of worth that will bring rewards. Whether you throw them at Jesus' feet or no matter what you do, don't you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Amen. So catch up if you haven't, and Jacob and Michaela are going to make some plaques and we'll present them to you. Okay? Isn't that beautiful? You can check it out. All handmade by them. I was going to get something from Amazon and they said, why can't we do it? And I'm like, that's so much better. So I'm so proud of that. So as I went through all these miracles of Elisha, I thought, well, I'm going to preach about it. I've got to preach on that floating axe head thing, right? You remember it? Did you read it? See, i got these deer and headlight looks from some of you. It's only about eight, nine verses, and it's kind of, what, what does this got to do with anything? But the more that you realize that every word is inspired by God and you see the purpose you see that even a little thing, because see, it was a borrowed axe, and the guy was distraught about the axe head falling in the river, and there's nothing you can do about it. And they were building a bigger place to house more prophets who were following after the ways of Elisha and everything. And he was worried because he lost his friend's axe head, and that, that might cause division in the church. <laughs> Imagine that. So Elisha said, where's it at? Threw the stick in there, and it floated. The little things God is so concerned about, because you are his children. But I'm not going to preach about that, okay? <laughs> Second Kings chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. When he went and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehaz Gehaza? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehaza answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female servants, slaves? Now let me tell you where we're at here. Elisha has a servant. <laughs> we're called servants, aren't we? And he's training him up like we're training up to follow after our master, our Lord, our King Jesus. And his servant said to, said to him, no, I wasn't doing this like his sins could be hidden from Elisha, let alone hidden from God, <laughs> right? And he got greedy because Elisha was offered pay, tribute. And he said, no, I'm not going to take it. But Gehazi said, uh, I'll take it. I'll run after him. I'll covet in my heart that 10th commandment. Oh, that one's a glitch, isn't it? It kind of just gets you no matter what. Even if you mark off all the others, you're going to fail on covet. And guess what? You really weren't marking off the others, but you, you'll get caught with that tenth one. And Elisha said to him, My spirit was with you. How much more is the spirit of God with us so that we can be holy temples to one another and to the world? Mm. Verse 27. Naaman's le leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants. Let me say that again. And to your descendants forever. See the punishment? Elisha well, wasn't messing around. You think God's going to mess around when he had his son placed on a cross, his blood poured out for you? You think he's going to mess around that day? Leprosy to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Your master is with you in spirit wherever you go. 
And Jesus says, nothing will be hidden. Nothing, not even a thought. We will be accountable for, for it. And we will be rewarded for the good and faithful things we've done. Well done, my faithful servant. To the one who had ten bags of gold, give him ten more. Not to the one that was, had five. He didn't get the extra. But he did the same thing. He took his five and made five more. The ten made ten more. And we know about the wicked servant. We're not even going there. But why did the guy with ten get ten more? Study it. God gives to those that are faithful so that they can faithfully carry out his mission, his ministry. So the more that you are faithful with, as, as the scripture says, the more that he will put you in charge of. Again, back to your children and, and you were there honoring that child that day. You're going to give that child more reward and responsibility because of his behavior. It's just natural and there's nothing wrong with it. How much more is your heavenly father going to give to you and to your descendants, your family, because of your faithfulness? <laughs> because Noah was faithful, his children went into the ark with him. Mm. 2 Kings 6, verse 14 to 17. We're talking about a different servant here. Then he sent his horses and chariots and strong, for, and strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God, Elisha, not the son of God, just the man of God, got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. Wouldn't that be the first thing you should ask? When trials come your way, or, or even when you get up and it's a beautiful day today. Oh my Lord, King Jesus, what should we do today? My life is yours, not my own. You sit on the throne, and I pledge you my allegiance and will serve you. Okay? Here's the answer. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Hmm, what a comforting thought. And Elisha prays, open his eyes, Lord. Hey, didn't we do a song like that? <laughs> Coincidence, right? Open his eyes, Lord, so that we may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That Shema prayer to hear and obey, to seek God's will rather than my own will, to seek his ways. When Jesus' disciple asked him how to pray, that's what he said. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will. There's a kingdom and there is a king and everyone else are his subjects. But yet he wants to know you and wants to love you completely. Wow, what a mighty God we serve. We have examples of good and bad kings all throughout, but they point to the king of all kings. God had warned them that the, that the kings would come and take their allegiance, take their families, take their tribute, where God tries to give us all these things. Going back to Genesis again, before any sin came in the world, he said it's not good for man to be alone, so he established marriage. And he gave them the blessing of having children. But yet the earthly kings will take those things from you. God will bless you for a thousand generations of those that love him. So I just remind you again what Troy said about you don't get near an earthly king, but you can come close to King Jesus because he wants to know you. He gave his life for you. Cora also said something that struck at my heart. She was talking about when the children had their salvation experience, when they first believed when they became a Christian, how did she say it? Did any of you catch that? It spoke to me because I don't say that enough. We don't say that enough. The day they gave their life to Jesus. That says something totally, totally different. Yeah, I'm saved with that. I'm safe and secure because he holds my life in his hand. But just think about it. When have you given your life to Jesus? He gave his life for you, and he expects you to do the same. 
in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? You see this pattern here that I'm putting for you so you'll realize who Jesus is? Then what does it say after that? We saw his star, because everything's his in the first place. We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. They traveled a long way. They gave him precious gifts, and they came to worship this baby as king of kings and lord of lords because he's the one that created them and gave them life in the first place. If we keep reading in Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Kings and kingdoms. This is he who, who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, which you'll start reading this week. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather, leather belt around his waist. Sounds a lot like Elisha and Elijah. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the, of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the ones that were religious in their day, he said, saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Your life should show your allegiance to the king. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as your father. Don't think you can say, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, if your life has not been given to him. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. Well, when Jesus started preaching, he said things a little differently, didn't he? No, he said the same thing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, <laughs> repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The message doesn't change. The King of all kings, Lord of all lords, did come to this earth because God does love you so much. But He will punish disobedience. And He will reward those faithful to Him. Have you given your life to King Jesus? Let's read on and see what Jesus says. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. What does he say next? Dute opiso mu. Give up all you have, and then come and follow me. You just see in there, come follow me, but that means I have to give away everything else. I can't let there be any distractions. I can't be controlled by the king of this world because Jesus is coming to rob him of his power. The true king is coming to give his life and give you power to live allegiance to him. Forsake everything, faith, forsaking all I trust him. You ever heard that in acronym? That's what faith means. To come follow after Jesus. And what will he do? I will send you out to fish for people. Make you fishers of men. Everything that you've been doing before, living for yourself, is going to change because this is the kingdom agenda. The only reason that God hasn't come back yet is because he is being patient, drawing more people to him. So if we get busy, he can come back. Yeah. And then we can be in heaven forevermore. Our mission is to be a light to this world who would light a lamp and then hide it that's just foolish at once verse 20 they left their nets they left their job they left their family everything they knew the security and everything else and they followed him going on from there he saw two brothers James son of Zebedee and his brother John they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets Jesus called to them now they've got their father in front of them <laughs> and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus demands your allegiance. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in, the, in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of what? 
the kingdom. King Jesus. Grab your Bibles. If you didn't read, I'm going to show you how to read this week's, this past week's stuff. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you. You can read it. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 9. And I'm going to pray before we read this, just to open your eyes. If you don't see Jesus in these verses, it's because you're, you're not looking whatsoever. So I'm going to pray first that our vision is clear, our hearts aren't distracted or divided, and that we see Jesus' words written so many years before, talking about kings and kingdoms with just this history, that Jesus is king of all kings. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word, that it is alive and living, and that every time we read it, that you speak to us more and more, and that every word is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. May we live a life that shows our children and our family and our friends and the world, even our enemies, that your words are true and they bring life, that we are your subjects and we pledge allegiance to you, the King Jesus. Open our eyes and our hearts as we read your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to read through it kind of fast so that I'm not here all day. But I'm going to start in, first, in 2 Kings 9 verse 1. The prophet Elijah, let me remind you, Elisha, and remind you that he's the man of God. He summoned a man from the, from the company of the prophets and said to him, Do this, and the man does it because he has given his allegiance to this man simply because he's a man of God, not the son of God. Okay? Tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of olive oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Now, Jehu, what's his name mean? Here's where we need to study a little bit. It means Jehovah is he. With that kind of name, wouldn't you think you need to act like God? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? Okay? Go to him. Get him away from his companions and take him into the inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. If he says that, then you should do it, right? I anoint you king over Israel. One man going because the man of God said to do this. Then what does he say next? Then open the door and run. Don't delay. Because this was something that could cost the man his life but he does it without questioning the man of God. Okay? Don't fear. Don't fear men. Fear the Lord instead, the one who can not only kill you, but then cast your soul into eternity in hell. Fear him, as Jesus says. Verse 4, So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead, the young prophet, inexperienced, young in age, but he knew his master said something. Verse 5, When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together because there were all commanders there. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. For, for you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet, prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. You see, these people react when they hear that. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. You have a new master, a new king. Don't fear this man who has murdered plenty of people. Don't fear him. Fear God. And I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. Do you think God will av avenge those who shed Jesus' blood, who aren't on his side? who haven't pledged his allegiance to him. Verse 8, The whole house of Ahab will perish. All of them, children, slaves, everyone associated with Ahab. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Kind of gruesome, but this is what God does for those who are disobedient. Then the servant opened the door, and he ran for his life. Eleven, when Jehu went out to, to his fellow officers, one of them asked, Is everything all right? 
Why did this maniac come to you? You know the man and the sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That's not true, they said. Tell us. See, they can see that something else went on. And they knew that this guy was from the man of God, so they at least wanted to listen, whether they wanted to hear and obey or not. Different story. But we'll see. Here's what he told me, Jehu said. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. What about Jesus? Is he king? Is, he is, <laughs> but is he your king? Verse 14, So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshus, conspired against Joram, the other king, wh whose name means Jehovah is exalted, but he didn't exalt him, did he? Okay? Now Joram and all of Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazel, king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Armenians had inflicted on him in the battle with Hazel, king of Aram. All these kings, fighting kings, thinking they're the stuff when they're not the king of all kings, are they? Jehu said, If you desire to make me king, then don't let any slip out of the city and go tell the news in Jezreel. Jesus tells us to go, to be fishers of men, to go first to our Jerusalem, then to our Judea, then to our Samaria, and then to the other ends of the earth, telling of the goodness of God, His grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Verse 16, Then he got into his chariot and rode to Jezreel, because Joram was resting there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. When the lookout standing on the tower of Jezreel... Now, wait a minute. We've seen Jezreel several times, right? What is Jezreel? Well, the word means God sows. Does it mean anything else? It should mean something to you, Merle. Talk about it in a minute, okay? When, we saw, when the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman... Jerome ordered, send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? Now think about that when Jesus says, did he come in peace? Or did he come to bring a sword to divide even people from their own parents over allegiance to him or not? Verse 18, the horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, this is what the king says, did you do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace? Jehu replied, fall in behind me. Who do you pledge your allegiance to? The lookout reported the messenger has reached them, but he isn't coming back. So the king sent out a second horseman. Then he came to, the, to them. He's, when he came to them, he said, This is what the king says. Not the real king, okay? Do you come in peace? Jehu replied, What do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. That's kind of like Jesus' answers when the disciples asked him a question Are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Hey, <laughs> doesn't even respond to that. He says, But you will receive power. And you will be my witnesses, that light to the world, carrying on my agenda because I am king. Verse 20, the lookout reported he has reached them but isn't coming back either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimsha. He drives like a maniac. <laughs> Get that again. Hitch up my chariot, Joram, Joram ordered. And when it was hitched up, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, rode out, each in his own chariot to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, the Jezreelite. You might remember him and what happened with Jezebel and everything, but we'll go on. When Joram saw Jehu, he asked, Have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace, Jehu replied, as long as the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel is around. God will not tolerate any of that. Joram turned about and fled, calling out to Ahaziah, Treachery, Ahaziah! The Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart. Please let the word of God pierce your heart instead of an arrow from the enemy. The arrow pierced his heart and he slumped down in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his chariot officer, pick him up and throw him on the field that belongs to Naboth the Jezreelite. You've got to read back, but that's just ultimate payback, okay? Remember how you and I were riding together in the chariots behind Ahab, his father, when the Lord spoke this prophecy against him. 
Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, and I will surely make you pay for it on this plot of ground, declares the Lord. See, God is sovereign. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. You can look up those words. He's everywhere. He knows everything. He has all power to do all things. He reigns supreme. And He gave His Son's life to die for you. He not only breathes breath of life into people, but He places the souls into every single one of you in every single place for His purpose. You can think of it as a chess game if you want to, but He's placed the players on the board where He wants them to be. Where you either pledge your allegiance to Him or He knows that you want and He uses you like He uses Pharaoh and Judas to bring Him glory or He uses you like He uses Joseph and Joshua to bring Him glory. Good analogy. Can you understand that? He is sovereign. You've got to decide whether you're on His side or not. <clears throat> Where am I at? 27? Or did I finish 26? I'm on 27. Okay. When Ahaziah king of Judah... Thank you for following along. When Ahaziah... Is that how you want it? I go with Ahaziah. Sorry. Well, you weren't there. I wasn't there. When Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw what happened, he fled up the road to Beth Hagen. Je Jehu chased him, shouting, Kill him too. <laughs> Second king, right? And he's got a third king to go. Or, or Yeah, we'll see. They wounded him in his chariot on the way up to Gerb near Iblium, and he escaped to Megiddo, and he died there. Uh-oh, Megiddo. Merle, does that name mean anything to you? The name means place of crowds. When we were in Israel, you remember hearing those jets fly over? We were looking out over this valley of Jezreel, and there's a Mount Carmel on one side, and there's a Mount Megiddo on the other. Megiddo is also a city. You might know that from what? Revelation, Armageddon on that field, and that word means a place of crowds because many will find the path that leads to destruction. Few will find the narrow path that leads to righteousness. But it's laid out before you. All you have to do is follow King Jesus. It goes on to say who's on his side and, and uh, Jehu destroys anyone who is not. Chapter 10, verse 1. Skip there. Because it didn't end with the kings. Now there were in Samaria 70 sons of the house of Ahab. That's more than anything you've read so far. 70 sons, and surely there's got to be some good ones in this. But what God says, He says. Maybe He stacked them all where they weren't. I don't know. I'm not God. But I know what He said. He just said, destroy them all because of the idolatry of their fathers. Now there were in Samaria 70 sons of the house of Ahab. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the officials of, of Jezreel, to the elders and to the guardians of Ahab's children, he said. You have your master's sons with you. You have your chariots and your horses, all these things that you can rely on, a fortified city and weapons. Now as soon as this letter reaches you, choose the best and most worthy of your master's son and set him on his father's throne. Then fight for your master's house. See, you are fighting for one master or the other. And Jesus was clear. There's no middle ground. You're either with him or you're against him. You're either gathering people into the fold or you're scattering because of your behavior. Because your idolatry, my idolatry, I'll say that too so you don't think I'm pointing fingers, scatters people. We see that all throughout these kingdoms and kings... But following Jesus Christ, relying on His power, following in His footsteps brings glory to God. They see God's love and they're drawn to Him. Verse 4, But they were terrified and said, If two kings could not resist Him, how can we? How can you resist Jesus, King of all kings? So the palace administrator, the city governor, the elders and the guardians sent this message to Jehu. We are your servants. <laughs> they had the fear of the Lord in them. And we will do anything you say. You can't just say I have the fear of the Lord in you and keep on living as you belong to the kingdom of this earth. 
You've got to choose sides. We will not appoint anyone as king. You do whatever you think is best. Your will be done, not ours. Then Jehu wrote them a second letter saying, If you are on my side and you will obey me, your actions approve your allegiance, just like James says, then take the heads of your master's son and come to me in Jezreel by this time tomorrow. No coincidence that that's where they brought him, is it? And they obeyed. They took sons because God said, do it. Now the royal princes of 70 of them were the leading men of the city who with the leading men of the city who were wearing them, when the letter arrived, these men took the princes and slaughtered all 70 of them. They put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jehu and Jezreel. When the messengers arrived, he told, he told Jehu, they have brought the heads of the, of the princes. Then Jehu ordered, put them in a pile at the entrance of the city gate until morning. The next morning Jehu went out. He stood before the people and said, you are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know then that not a word the Lord has spoken against the house of Ahab will fail. If God has that much sovereignty to carry out his words, then he will carry out everything that talks about Jesus' return. The Lord has done what he announced through his servant Elijah, the man of God, not the son of God. So Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel who remained in the house of Ahab, as well as all his chief men, his close friends, and his priests, leaving him no survivor. God will stamp out all sin. Jehu then set out and went toward Samaria at Beth Echid of the shepherds. He met some relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and asked, Who are you? They said, We are relatives. Oh. <laughs> You don't even want to be associated with sin. We are called out, made holy, just like the, the things in the temple were made holy to serve God. You are a holy priesthood. You should be holy. We are relatives of Ahaziah, and we have come down to greet families of the king and queen mother. Take them alive, he ordered. So they took them alive and slaughtered them by the well at Beth Echid. Forty-two of them, he left no survivor. After he left there, he came, came upon Jehonahab, son of Rechab, which, oh, that word means Jehovah is willing. He's willing to save you. Are you willing to pledge your allegiance to him? I am Jehonahab, he answered. If so, said Jehu, give me your hand. So he did, and Jehu helped him into the chariot. Jehu said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Then he had him ride along in his chariot. When Jehu said, came to Samaria, he killed all who were left there of Ahab's family. He destroyed them according to the word spoken to Elijah, the man of God. Do you think Jesus' words, the Son of God, are something you can just let go in one ear and out the other and not call to action, not take allegiance, not take seriously? I was talking to Troy the other day, too, and we were talking. He said, you know, if Christians, not, not those maybe that gave their life to Jesus, because maybe they understand it a little bit more, but Christians believed 2% is what we came up with of the Bible and put it into action, this world would be a different world. You've read half the Bible so far, and you know what I'm talking about if you have, because so many of these things, I can never do this. The Spirit of God living in you says you can. You've just got to decide whose kingdom you're standing for. I'm going to close with a couple of verses from Revelation. I don't think I was as long as Troy, so hey, I'm just reminding you that. Revelation 16, verse 14 to 16. There are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the world, the whole world, to gather them for the battle on that great day of God Almighty. Look, these are red words, these are Jesus' words. I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Every thought, every deed. Then they gathered the kings together 
to the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon, the city or hill of Megiddo. Same thing that we're reading about in the Old Testament where there were these mighty miracles and where there was many people slaughtered. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 to 10, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding a golden bowl full of incense which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons, people, children, whatever you want to put in there, from every tribe and language and people and nation. He purchased you and I. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. One more scripture. Revelation 19, starting in verse 9. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at my feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit that bears prophecy who bears test for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. I saw heaven standing open, and there was before me a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were fo following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father in heaven, we thank you that King Jesus would sacrifice his life for us. That you loved us enough that you sent your son to die in our place. And then you sent your spirit to empower us to live a life that we see no one can live without Jesus Christ. We thank you for his perfect sacrifice. We thank you for his words that it is finished that Satan has no authority and dominion here. And Father, we thank you that he said, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness, that our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. But help us, Lord, not to be complacent. Help us to fear you and to raise up our children and to tell our friends and our neighbors and even our enemies about your love and the coming wrath for those that don't know you. Lord, may we be a light to this world. May we be a city on the hill. Thank you for each and every one here and the spirit that ties us all together as brothers and sisters, as children, as, as the family of God. We pray this in your name. Amen.